Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response. Uh, this is session, section, session, session 66 in our series that began in March of 2020, as some of you, many of you, uh, will know and has proceeded since. Uh, initially in response to the pandemic, but then there was one disaster after another, one crisis after another, even in just in 2020, a health crisis, uh, uh, social crisis, economic crisis, and of course, the climate uh, is uh, kind of the big kahuna of crises. Um, this is part of our Broadband from Space series. Uh, uh, this today's session of libraries is climate adaptation leaders. And so this is a, uh, a point, a message that we've been making throughout uh, for this role for libraries as so-called second responders and, uh, and also the, the use of satellite connectivity uh, generally and specifically for that uh, role. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, a uh, global consortium of uh, libraries experimenting and exploring various kinds of uh, technologies communications principally, but not only. Uh, we're hosted and uh, recorded today and every day by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague, as many of you would know. Uh, our series sponsor is the Internet Society, who's been graciously supporting uh, our work here, especially as we have focused lately on low Earth orbit satellite connectivity. Thank you, Internet Society. Our media sponsor is Broadband Broadband Breakfast, uh, who's given us good coverage uh, and continues to. Uh, this is our um, this is our our series um, exploring different aspects of uh, so-called LEO, low Earth orbit satellite technologies, to expand education and particularly in our case today, enhance community resilience against disasters. We're going to focus a little bit on that technology, but also on the sort of the wider uh, role of libraries in disaster response and, and preparation uh, that may or may not have anything to do with uh, low Earth orbit communications, though it has. I'll touch on that a little bit before we start. Uh, the the capability of this technology to reach any place on the planet gives it well it's unique in that regard and it disintermediates uh terrestrial infrastructure the towers and the cables and so forth that that extend across the landscape to reach the most remote places stop before they get there because it's just too expensive and the people are too far out and they don't have enough money all the all the market factors that that continue to keep roughly 3 billion people uh, from participating in the digital society that we've built uh, that has this rebuilding us as far as that goes. Uh, and, and we've also touched on well, what does that mean to the rest of the telecommunications ecosystem? It's, it's an interesting question. We don't really know yet. We don't know exactly how well and how long it will work, but right now it's working pretty well to, uh, to provide broadband you know, like instantly. Uh, it's literally plug and play technology as we experience it so far. You get a dish, you get a bundled router and a cable. Uh, and it's a, it's an Ethernet cable. You plug it in. You've got power to this dish, which orients itself to the satellite constellation overhead. It says, here I am. And it's so being within 10 minutes, you're live with, you know, 50, 100 megabit connection, depending on the service level that you that you acquire. So this, these three barriers to adoption we've identified within the context of, of well, just as barriers to adoption, availability, uh, affordability, and usability. Uh, unless it's available, the other two really are, are moot questions. It doesn't matter how much it costs or how little. If it's not there, you, you can't use it. Uh, so satellite technology creates instant availability practically anywhere so then you get to affordability and usability and those two uh, aspects or, or barriers are addressed 
certainly in part by libraries, which have long history of, of uh, answering affordability questions. This is, you know, your, uh, we, we compile all these resources for the community and then we share them on a no cost or low cost basis. And so no matter how little you have, you can get a book or you can access the internet if, it, if your library is connected uh, for free. And then usability is, is a big question. There are a lot of elements to that, but most of those are, are answered by libraries. Uh, so what does it even mean? What, how do I use it? What's it good for? Uh, how do I connect to it? So libraries can help people get started, set up accounts, lend you a device, different kinds of uh, ways to make make this technology useful. So the, the point is between low Earth orbit satellites and public libraries and their traditional role and services, those two elements combine to address all three of these barriers. Not entirely, it's not you know broadband in your home, but it should be broadband in your community. Some place close to everybody is what our our mantra has been. Every community connected. We're working on that. So um, uh, this is a, a great uh, definition from uh, the American Library Association's recent paper: Sustainability in Libraries. Community resilience is the sustained capacity of communities to withstand adapt to and recover from adversity and disruption. Uh, an example of that using low Earth orbit uh, satellite connections, connections is a, uh, a project that we've been able to, to fund in Montana, where a small town, Anaconda, Montana, western part of the state, very remote, small town, uh, fed by a single fiber connection, which is not uncommon in, in remote places. If they have any connectivity, there's a fiber gets somewhere close to it, if not to some kind of a, a switch in the region. Uh, it was cut, a uh, common kind of a thing, a backhoe, you know, cut the line and everybody is out, including the cell providers who depend on that same fiber. So there was no connectivity in the entire region, except for the little library, which had a satellite dish. This goes directly to the constellation. and that's where everybody was able to connect for that for that period. Now, that wasn't an extreme weather outage, but it was an outage. And it really doesn't matter what the cause of the outage is. Over time, you get really hungry for connectivity. And so that's a small example. The, I guess the big example would be in uh, Florida, where Hurricane Ian swept through a wide swath of the state, just wiped out everything. It's still wiped out in a lot of places. And what the state did was uh, acquire hundreds of these uh, Starlink satellite dishes and deployed them to public locations uh, uh, in, in that outage area and just were able to provide that kind of connectivity to people that just were stuck. And if you've ever been through an extended outage, you, you feel it in a way that it's just hard to describe abstract. You go, okay, I understand, no, no connectivity. But if you don't actually have it for a period of a day or more, then you really feel it. So our speakers, Diane and Michelle, will, will join. Uh, we'll start here shortly. I want to finish a couple of points on this. Uh, this is the IPCC's warning as of yesterday. Major climate change is inevitable and irreversible. I don't want to spend too much time convincing everybody that this is all real. Uh, I'm we're at the point we've been talking about this for years, and of course, it's been going on for longer than that. But we're assuming at this point, everybody's kind of bought into the fact that this is really happening. So, OK, what does that mean? Um, you know, tremendous heat wave in Europe uh, this this winter happening, I think, still right now. When I say heat wave, I'm talking about the difference between what should be happening in the middle of winter and what is happening today. These uh, enormous, unprecedented uh, uh, increases in heat, breaking records, you know, by the thousands every day. Uh, it's just more evidence of the the instability of uh, climate, weather patterns, they seem persistent, but it turns out that they're actually not. They're, they're, they're kind of delicate. They can be uh, disrupted because of this accumulation of, of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. Uh, while we're looking at Europe, I'd also like to uh, welcome a lot of our visitors seem to be from, uh, 
from Europe, um, as well as uh, Africa. I haven't had a chance to check the uh, attendee uh, list. Uh, many of you, most of you perhaps, are from the U.S., and so a lot of this will be familiar to you, but I want to welcome everybody, and I want to thank uh, the uh, IFLA group, uh, Insulib, E-N-S-U-L-I-B, is a uh, subgroup of IFLA that is focused on sustainability, and they're doing great work and uh, have uh, uh, taken a lead in what we see is a really interesting phenomena of a global event that affects everyone, everyone, uh, being addressed by a global network of libraries, which are typically local community services. So that excites us about the prospect of, of all those communities being able to uh, connect with each other, uh, share information and resources with each other, and, you know, with resources from any level, uh, like the national reports or the international reports and resources that we'll hear more about, uh, or the state level, uh, as we'll hear about from New Jersey. And, and that's that's fascinating. We we were we were looking at that phenomena when the pandemic hit. Okay, this is this is a pandemic hitting everybody in the world, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and it should have, we hoped it would, kind of bind the world together a little bit. But it seems like while it shook up a lot of people and still shaking us up, it didn't create the kind of unity uh, of approach that one would have hoped for. Um, <laughs> billion dollar weather disasters last year, uh, not all year, just up through September. It's, uh, it's an astonishing number of, uh, you know, huge amounts of money. These, these events are getting more serious and, and more frequent and more expensive. Uh, this is an interesting diagram. Uh, these two elements of response, which are mitigation and adaptation. We're focusing on adaptation because we think that's really where uh, there's been less attention and also where anybody can do something. Now, we can all do something about mitigation. We can, you know, uh, put solar panels on our roof and so forth. That's all great, uh, but it's gonna take large scale actions to actually slow this thing down, much less reverse it. We're in for a rough ride. No matter if we stop carbon today, it would still be rough. It's our, you know, it's happening now and it will get worse, The uh, even if we don't add any more carbon. So, that leaves us with adaptation. And adaptation is something that uh, seems, it makes sense at, at every level, but especially at the community level. And this is where we think libraries have a special role to play. And so I recommend this, this graph and these uh, different services to you. Um, so to our speakers, and um, uh, I welcome Diane Connery, the director of the Pottsboro, Texas Library. Uh, Diane's been innovating like mad for it seemed like the last, well, 10 years or so, leading on every kind of application and community service, telehealth, uh, esports. Uh, Diane has is, is really put Pottsboro uh, and North Texas actually on, on the map. And we'll hear what she went through with another kind of crisis, which is. Uh, the, the ice storm that hit Texas, uh, not last year, the year before last, I think. And Michelle Stricker from uh, the New Jersey State Library, who has uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, toolkit to share with us. And so with that, I am going to stop share and turn things over to Diane to tell us about what she's been doing. Welcome, Diane. Good to have you back. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Um, and we're going from the big picture you discussed to small picture in a little rural town in North Texas. So Pottsboro is about 90 miles north of Dallas, a town of 2,600 people within city limits, and then additional people who live outside of 
city limits. And if you live outside of city limits, there's the the your law enforcement agency is the sheriff. And if they're across the county, it takes an hour for them to get to you. So one of the things we're thinking about in terms of emergency response is um, the citizens have to be the first responders because it can be a long time. Uh, we have volunteer fire department, and as I mentioned, sheriff covers a large county. So um, what we're focusing on as a library is helping um, support things until first responders can can get to us. So in February of 2021, you may remember hearing that our electric grid in Texas shut down. So um, it shut down for seven days in some locations. And what the and then the really big unexpected consequence of that is water shut down. And so um, not only did you not have electricity, you didn't have water. And in a small town with a city manager who is, you know, busy literally digging ditches to replace broken water lines, um, local government doesn't have the capacity to um, lead emergency response. And as it happens in our county, the Office of Emergency Management didn't know who to contact in Pottsboro to help. And they were also busy with um, larger towns. So um, communication, the way we started reaching out to people is uh, just, you know, a small town, you know, your neighbors, and we knew people outside of city limits who had wells and their wells were still running. And um, so we started as a library contacting these ranchers and saying, do you have a working well and would you be willing to share your water? Um, several of them stepped up and then brought these huge tanks into town, into the library. And then through Facebook, primarily the library, we started reaching out to people and saying, well water is available here at the library. If you can get to us, bring any kind of container you want and we'll fill you up. So some of that water, I've learned more about water than I ever thought I'd know. Some of that water was the quality that you could drink, but some was not. It was water that you could flush your toilets with. And so when your water and electricity goes out, particularly if you live in an apartment building, um, the snow that people were gathering to melt and then flush their toilets quickly ran out because those, there wasn't that much snow. So now picture you're in an apartment building, nobody can flush their toilets and there's no drinking water, no water to wash dishes. And then if you don't have transportation, Water is heavy to carry, so you can't even get to the library with, you know, a cooler or jugs to get the water because it's just too heavy to carry back to your home. So um, as a library, we started coordinating with some of those ranchers to go out to some sites where more people lived, apartments, and then I'd go door to door knocking and say, you know, please bring your container down and um, get the water you need. So um, mostly through Facebook and I love a small town. So many people started reaching out to help. Um, and then um, in the middle picture there, you can get a good picture of how the snow was melting. And that may have been uh, like the third day that there was that amount of snow left um, and the coolers and people lining up to, to get water. So as it turns out, as this was happening, um, there were, uh, I think United Way had a semi truckload of blankets, but they didn't know who to contact in Pottsboro to get blankets to the people. Um, and that is one of the spoiler alert. That's one of the things we've learned from that is making sure that we're connecting with the people 
in our county. Um, so they have my cell number. They know who to call with things like this come up because what had happened is the city staff wasn't going in to city hall and nobody was answering phones. So uh, it was kind of like a coup that the library <laughs> took over, took over Pottsboro. Um, restaurants were closed, but uh, this, this restaurant owner in the bottom right um, said that if we could get well water to her to cook, she had food that would start going bad that she needed to get rid of. And so she cooked a hundred meals um, that then we brought to the library and um, had people just come here and pick up. If they couldn't pick it up, um, we were taking it to them, like the housing authority housing. And I will also say some of our um, the network of citizens we developed, there were some homebound people who um, couldn't even get out at all to, to get water. So we had citizen volunteers going into people's home, filling up their toilet tanks so that they could um, flush their toilets. And if you've never been in a webinar about porta potties, now you can say you have been, um, <laughs> because again, through relationships and connections, we we knew a, a business that had porta potties, and so they set two up in the library parking lot so that people could um, come here and use the porta potties. We tried to uh, add some humor to it on our, our Facebook message and saying, don't take your library books into the, the porta potty. Um, but it did, it starts to become a public health issue for people. Um, and, and then other nonprofits in the area kicked in and started bringing bottled water to us and an empty jug. So it was everyone working together. And um, then as the city government and county government was able to start catching up, they were releasing updates on through Code Red. Um, but if you don't have a smartphone, there's an issue for you. If you don't know how to go online and, and sign up for Code Red, that's another issue. And so that's another place that the library can help on an ongoing basis to help people sign up for, for Code Red. Um, we did get a lot of um, TV coverage and just strategically for us, that's always important to help the public understand that we're not a book warehouse, that, that we are an essential service, especially in a small town we're always looking for ways that we can um, prove to our funders that we are worthy of funding because we provide essential services. So afterwards, um, we held some community conversations, some debriefs, and um, we, we needed to be very careful that it wasn't um, an indictment of city government because um, we didn't want to to set them up that way. But one of the things that came out of it was that recognition that in a small town, people need to have phone trees available that they can call and just check on their neighbors that we cannot wait for first responders to come in and help us. We have to save ourselves in, in those um, emergency situations. So bottom right is a charger I have that has solar panels. That kept me able, my cell phone and laptop charged throughout the event because I could use the solar panels to keep the charger going. Upper right are router boxes people can um, check out now from the library. And if they live within a mile radius of the, the library, they can have internet um, from the tower in our back parking lot in their homes. But, you know, thinking about how we get connectivity to people in their homes who don't have it. And so um, being solution oriented, one of the things that we did was um, built a relationship with the County Office of Emergency Management 
they offer, I believe, it, yeah, nine week course, which was intensive training. Um, I know how to apply a tourniquet now if anybody needs uh, a nine week course for um, citizens, if, for citizens to learn how to be a community emergency response team. And they um, give us these, these packs, but we um, practice using fire extinguishers, chemical spills, all kinds of responses. We know how to be first responders now. And of course, our role as um, community emergency response team is we'll take the lead. And as soon as first responders get to our location, we can brief them. And then, of course, they they take the lead at, at that point. Um, but that that has helped immensely in and um, connecting citizens with one another to learn what we can do it as individuals. And boy, I really paid attention to fire extinguishers um, and the importance of those after after that class. Uh, so recently, the Rural Health Information Hub has released a toolkit and um, it is for Rural em Emergency Preparedness and Response Toolkit, has some wonderful resources and they did a whole section on the Pottsboro Library and what we learned, we did not have an emergency plan in advance of this event, um, so it was building the plane as we fly, as we often do. Um, but I, I highly recommend looking through their, their toolkit for, for resources. Uh, yep, that's, that's what I had done. I'm going to stop sharing. Don, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Diane. Excellent. As as ever, the the notion uh, uh, of the sort of limits of first responders in disasters, I think, is a really important one, because we tend to think, well, that's you know that's what we rely on in an emergency. Are these people that that's what they do every day? Well, that's true, but in a large scale event, they they're overwhelmed, they're swamped, they can't do everything that needs to be done, and so. That's where this idea of second responders come in. That uh, uh, that you know, it's a broad category of of uh, institutions, uh, of which libraries and schools and uh, you know, telephone repair people all fall in that category. They're doing vital work to recover and respond to these large scale events, um, and so the 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 tools that uh, are out there and the and the unique role that libraries seem to play in communities as a as a trusted source of information uh, and even shelter if that's you know if that's what's needed uh, what what we've discovered in these large scale outages that there are there are the, really the first priority that people have after an extended period of time is electrical they they need to charge their devices and then they also need to connect but this electricity seems to be a really key key component so i have no idea what the number of the percentage of library facilities that have backup power might be i hope it's a very high percentage it should be because these these uh, events are are coming at us and that's something that uh, really is is essential is because we've electrified our entire civilization um but uh the the fact that uh, that Diane and the Pottsboro library was able to organize so much activity volunteers helping neighbors I mean how does that happen okay I know three or four neighbors around me I can check in with them but I can do more than that if I can or maybe I need help so What's the communication vehicle for all that? I doubt there's any kind of formal setup in most places, but except that people will tend to turn to the library to find out what's going on because that's normally what people do. So uh, great. Uh, 
uh, we'll come back to questions, but let's get to Michelle here, and then we'll we'll, we'll conclude with questions. So, uh, Michelle, welcome, and uh, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, Don, thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here this morning. And I want to just uh, give a shout out to Diane and her library for doing like, such an amazing job. And what you're going to hear me talk about today, sort of um, more generally, uh, Diane's library took it away and actually implemented a lot of the ideas that um, that I'm gonna to present to you this morning. So let me share my screen and um, give me a second here, share. Here we go. Uh, so I'm gonna to talk today about um, from disaster planning to commu uh, community resilience. And I called it the long and short of it. And I'm gonna tell you why in a second. But for this presentation, because my time was limited, I just chopped off the long of it. So we're only gonna focus on the short of it today. And I'm going to um, explain what I mean by that in a second. But let me just turn off, if you all don't mind, I'm gonna just turn off my camera because I tend to wave my arms around a lot when I talk and, and you don't need to see that. So, so, so here we go. Okay, so um, what happened was in the work that I've been doing over really the last decade and disaster preparedness uh, started with, um, Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey and New York, of course, you all have heard of that, back in 2012. And that's when we realized, and you know, I had been doing work in disaster preparedness strictly on, um, you know, facility-based plans and collection planning that had to do with saving your most, you know, precious collections in the library. So it was all internal facing. Uh, and you're familiar with a lot of those plans, like D plans, a lot of them were like 100 pages long. Uh, I know there was a deep plan light that became uh, like 25 pages. But again, every in the beginning, everything was focused on traditionally the collections and the facilities and calling in the freezer trucks when there was a fire and water damage and things like that. And so that was kind of the long of it, you know, and Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey for me changed everything back in 20. 12. And that's what I call sort of like the transition period. And that's where the library became known as Ports in the Storm, because everyone showed up, at least in New Jersey, and I know in uh, all the other states that have these types of emergencies in their communities, everyone's going to show up at the library the very next day or as soon, soon as the storm or the emergency passes. So that was sort of the transition phase. The library is a safe haven as a place for people to come. Um, get some coffee, get a warm coat, you know, find out information mainly. And now what I focus on is this whole community uh, disaster response approach. And Diane really talked about that a lot. So it, it, it moved from traditional disaster planning of these very long plans through this transition. And we'll talk about the toolkit that I have up on the State Library's website. But now I'm focused on the immediate aftermath of the community. So you can see it's sort of like this was iteration after iteration. It was a reframing of the conversation from internal library perspective to this whole community approach. And that's what I've been focusing on um, for the last couple of years. Um, I do want to note that um, all of the uh, workshop, the workbooks and the toolkits and the, um, the plans that I talk about were all based and came from my adaptation of emergency management tools. Because when I compare the two, I found that emergency management approached the disaster very differently than the library did. And so I wanted to make sure that the library could integrate as much as possible into what emergency management was doing so that they would be using, um, become as effective as possible uh, in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, but also that uh, they would understand where emergency management was coming from and it, understanding the language of emergency management. So I really wanted a different kind of a tool that um, was based on what an emergency manager would use. And that, that was easy, that was easy to fill out. 
And that's when I worked with um, Don Byrne, who is actually, um, he, it, he works in emergency management and risk assessment. And um, he really helped me put together this librarian's disaster planning and community resilience guidebook. There's a guidebook piece, and then there's a work a workbook piece. So really what the toolkit, you know, it's, it's designed to increase your coping capacity. I want it to be very easy to use with planning and training guides. And, and more importantly, and most importantly, I wanted it to be from the emergency management perspective, because when I looked at the results of the toolkit, there was some very different thinking uh, that was brought in by a man, uh, emergency management, which I really thought enhanced the library's ability to deal um, with uh, a disaster, to increase uh, coping uh, capacity. And all of that is really how you're going to be able to develop um, a resilient library that's going to get you through these difficult situations, that's going to get you up and running either with a little interruption or no interruption. During Hurricane Sandy, what we found in New Jersey was that homes were damaged, businesses were damaged, library buildings, except for the few that were sort of in Ocean County along the coastline there, um, that, that were totally wiped out. Mainly library buildings were okay, but they lost power. So that's when everyone came the day after into the libraries. And having that kind of resiliency in your library, you're enabled then to, um, to uh, provide your community with the resources that they need to cope with their own emergencies. You know, And so being able to have you quickly recover makes um, ensures that there's going to be rapid recovery. And, and most importantly, you want this return to normalcy uh, for all aspects of the community, business, household, schools, and, you know, among municipal agencies, among um, anyone else that's in your community. You want to make sure that you get them back on their feet as rapidly as possible to enable the community to recover. So some of the interesting, um, I'm not going to, I know you can't read this. I'm going to just, this is sort of what it looks like. There's a separate guidebook and then that tells you how to fill out the workbook. And I'm just going to point out, a, a, I'll read out a couple of chapters in here uh, that are not, you're not going to typically find in a library disaster plan. So there's a four-step process for assessing risks that might happen in your community, um, including a matrix that you can fill out. There's a learning and notification systems. There's effective use of social media, which I think librarians are especially adept at using, um, you know, social media to get out the um, to get out vetted information to the community. There's um, key roles such as, you know, putting together an emergency planning committee, and then they talk a little bit about the the language of uh, emergency management, and that is the incident command system. Now, the incident command system was, came about in the 1970s um, as a result of the California wildfires, where you had all these emergency responders coming together from all sorts of areas, but they called they they called the names different things. So one would call it a disaster, one would call it an incident, and they couldn't communicate together. So they came up with this, this chain of command system where when you come together and you bring together different emergency responders, they default to this language so that they understand each other. And you could go on the FEMA website. There's actually two programs on there. One is a, um, a definition or just like kind of shows you the layout of the incident command system. And it talks about the responsibilities of, you know, a finance officer, a logistics officer, a safety and security officer, um, safety wardens. And then there's a, 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 a really full program that you can take uh, if you want to become sort of certified in, uh, the, in using ICS, the incident command system. But further things in the chapter uh, deal with how you uh, would uh, manage disruptions from individuals. And well, what are you going to do if people won't leave your library? So one of the things we found in New Jersey, which was very upsetting uh, for librarians, where you know, they're not shelter in place. You know, they don't do shelter in place. They don't have the capacity to do that. So at the end of the day, uh, and many of them would open their doors with no power and then of course had to close as soon as it got dark and Sandy was at the end of October and it was, I remember it was extremely cold.
that year, you had people at the end of the day as it was getting dark with nowhere to go and they refused to leave the library. And the librarians simply did not have the capacity uh, to handle that and it was extremely upsetting to them. So there's a section in there on, on how to deal with that. It also talks about cyber security, um, uh, evacuation and shelter locations, crisis communications, and you can see there's a long, um, there's a very, very long list of things in the, um, in the toolkit. Now, the toolkit is meant for you <clears throat> to um, pick and choose what's right for your library. And, you know, our focus here in library development in New Jersey is on public libraries. But really, this is for any kind of library, academic, special. You each have your own communities. You can each pick and choose what you think, um, what worksheets you think are going to work best for your library. So you see these long lists of, you know, these long lists of items here, and you don't have to do them all. They're, they're for you to customize and use in whatever way you see fit what you need for, uh, from your library. Uh, so that's on our website. And Don, afterwards, I can send you links to any of uh, any of these things. If you want to get them out to uh, the attendees, just let me know. So moving on from sort of that interim uh, library safe haven idea, I started to think about what are more rapid response and recovery tools that emergency managers um, are using. And, you know, I think Diane brought it up too. Um, you know, local officials, relief workers, they're going to be on the scene immediately after a disaster, but they simply cannot reach everyone. There's just not enough of it, uh, enough people around to help. And what I heard our manage, uh, emergency managers talking about is that in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, um, getting help might take hours and it might even take days. And that's just with your regional and your local emergency responders. It's really estimated that after a major disaster, uh, FEMA could take up to 10 days to get into their, your community. So I started thinking about the most important thing for the library to deal with are the hours and the first three days after the disaster, because people are gonna be at your door um, whether they use the library or not, they know where you are and they're going to be at your door and they're going to be needing help immediately. So I started thinking of what tools are going to be useful immediately after the disaster. And I'm going to talk about one of them today, which is the emergency action plan, or sometimes you'll see it referred to as the incident action plan. Um, but first, we're going to deal a little bit with situational awareness you know, and exactly what that means and how that's going to play into your immediate response after a disaster. So situational awareness, um, I think that uh, people need to learn um, how to successfully handle disasters effectively and efficiently. And you have to sort of make the right decision at the right moment under these, like, let's face it, these extremely stressful situations. You're either in the middle of this crisis or you're in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. And so how are you going to respond to what's happening around you and quickly assess, you know, what's going to happen in the future so that you can craft this effective um, response right now. And that's what's called situational awareness. It's the ability to respond quickly, to adjust your reaction and your response to disaster, to the disaster that's at hand. So you see, this doesn't really work well with a pull off the shelf disaster plan that you've, you've done in advance, although you still do need to have that plan, but every emergency is different and you've got to react to it at the time that it's happening. So it's gonna be this critical assessment where you're gonna identify what's actually happening right now, what your problems are, and then you're gonna even gauge the significance of each problem so that you can craft a response. Now, when emergency management talks about situational awareness, they're always gonna prioritize it according to this list, okay? Life and safety is first, it's number one, always. Then it is incident stabilization. An incident is a term 
from the incident command system. They don't call it disasters, they call them incidents. So that's why, you know, it's really good for you to take a look at the FEMA to, uh, uh, site and just learn sort of these term, the terminology in the ICS system. So you understand and you speak the same language as your emergency responders. And then only after those two things are you going to concentrate on the preservation, say, of your facility and your collections. So that's what situational awareness is. And it really plays um, a strong role in crafting your response immediately in the hours immediately after, um, after a disaster. As we move into what's the emergency action plan, and I do have a template for this, which I did again adapt from emergency management, and I can send that to Don for you all. So the emergency action plan is like this really written procedure that tells you how you're going to respond or what your craft your response to these different types um, of emergencies. And it really is an essential component uh, that you're going to use immediately afterwards rather than your typical disaster plan. So the, the EAP is going to be able to be adapted for a wide range of emergencies. And you're going to find that all of these emergencies are going to include sort of similar components, but they're also going to have these unique uh, components uh, that you're going to need to include in the planning um, when you finally write down the plan. So that's why it's important to identify uh, emergencies most likely uh, to impact your library. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, this comment is old now. So for example, Florida is not gonna spend time preparing for a power loss due to a winter storm. But you know, anything goes these days with global warming and we're finding these bizarre situations in places that you would never think, you know, uh, that there would be a snowstorm before. But uh, at any rate, you know, the, it could be something like during a fire, the, the, the emergency action plan means get out of the building. That's gonna craft your response. But during a tornado, you want everyone to stay inside the building. And active shooter is some of both. You're either gonna hide or evacuate depending on what your best action is, um, you know, your best option is. And so that's what's great about uh, the EAP. It's meant to be used immediately after the disaster, it's meant to be a crafted response right on the spot, you know, and in the very beginning, using situational awareness, oftentimes the EAP is not even written down. It's sort of your gut reaction. You know what you have to do immediately afterwards, and you're going to start doing it. But eventually you are going to be writing this emergency action plan down. And not only that, it's going to change and it's going to change again as the incident progresses through the natural stages, you're going to update the plan and update the plan and refine it, you know, and hone it as you, you go along. So as we move further into the short of it, there is sort of, there's this great shift now to uh, what's called people-centered emergency response to help uh, improve community resilience. And um, it's, as we said, it's a whole community disaster response. And I thought about um, uh, something that I saw in Seattle, and I'll talk about it a little more in a couple of slides. And that is the library as an emergency communications hub. It's sort of like treating it as a home base um, after a disaster. And we're really um, thinking in a different way about this. It's not like what's in your emergency toolkit, it's who's in your emergency toolkit. Who can you call upon in your uh, emergency, like Diane was able to do with her library? Who's gonna be able to help you out? Who are those partners in your community? It's yes, you have to have some, some supplies on hand, but that's not as important as having your connections, your network out you know, into the community. And it's really, you know, about community empowerment. As, you know, Diane said, people turned out after the emergency. They turned out and they wanted to help. And we find, and emergency responders more importantly have found, that people are really very capable problem solvers on their own. They really don't need a lot of training. They know what they need to do to help themselves. So we want to be able to 
use that uh, to uh, the advantage of the, com of the community. Um, emergency managers are also developing new ways to work with the community. I attended a, a webinar that was done by an emergency manager in Australia, where he started to recognize, his team was recognizing the capability of people in the community to help themselves. Whereas before librarians were always trying to reach out, we always said, you need to integrate into emergency management. You need to let them know what they're doing um, because you know, they're so busy. You need to remind them of what, what the library has to offer. Well, you know what? They're paying attention now because of all everything that's happened with libraries around the world, uh, sort of picking up and, and moving into this response and resiliency mode. They're noticing that libraries are doing this really well and that the community you know, is able to do this really well you know, themselves. So um, we call these where people come out um, uh, immediately after uh, an emergency. They're sort of one-off events. They're spontaneous volunteers. And so these vo spontaneous volunteers that come out free up emergency managers time that they're able to really deal with the larger crisis, you know? And so they trust the community to know what it needs and sort of help itself. Now, the one thing I want to say about uh, spontaneous volunteers, you, you know they're, they're going to come out for the one-off events. It's not a long-term commitment um, in their part, and they can really be helpful uh, to the library as you set up some sort of communications hub. Um, however, emergency managers also fear spontaneous volunteers because they can't use them in an emergency. All right, they're not trained. All right, so like Diane got cert training, those people they can use. But when people just spontaneously show up and say, I want to help, they're not able, that it, it could just become chaos for emergency responders. And so really they're not going to want to deal with that. But that's where I think the library is really going to be able to step into this, uh, you know, this, com this communications hub role and I think that libraries are gonna be able to um, use these spontaneous volunteers. And I don't wanna say like, let's take them off the hands of the emergency managers, but I'm sure that emergency management will, will breathe a sigh of relief because that in itself uh, can become an emergency for them when they just have you know all these people show up and wanna help, which is of course a natural thing that we all wanna do. Um, you know, as long as, you know, as soon as we find out we're safe, our family's safe, we want to get out and we want to help other people. So uh, this is really people-centered uh, emergency management. That in its own is a great way to improve community resilience, because as, you know, we said, and, and also, Diana, I keep bringing you up, but you, you did mention all these points, you know, the capabilities of emergency management is really limited. So the, the capabilities of the community is gonna far exceed what emergency managers can do for us. And um, also by using volunteers and by us taking a lead role, we're gonna ensure that we are really doing this community-driven response that's gonna be very inclusive of our whole community. We're gonna know the communities that aren't uh, being reached. We're gonna focus on our own neighborhoods, on our own towns, and this is gonna just enhance our networking and promoting uh, the promoting of this whole community response. We wanna make sure we get to people that we don't normally get to. And I think the library is just the perfect, uh, 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 perfect for that. The, um, so I know I'm talking really fast, but there's a lot of stuff here. And the latest presentation I did was strictly on these emergency communication hubs, um, library emergency communications hub. And so here's sort of the definition um, of, of what that is. You know, it's a place where the library is going to coordinate and provide all of the information so that citizens can help each other um, in the community immediately after a disaster, from immediately after to the first three days or so. And it's a place where the community comes so they know what's happening in the neighborhood. They're gonna get information. Um, it's a safe place, okay? The library is safe haven. Um, and it's a place where the libraries are gonna provide information that's gonna help everyone make informed decisions 
And the library is even going to step into a, a role of communication uh, between the library and the community and local government. And these are pictures of actual library communication hubs. You can see they're nothing fancy. Anyone can do them to, to any size. If your building is open, you of course can go indoors with, with, with it. And um, if not, you can set up outdoors, you set up tables, you set, you have pop-up tents, you have the, you know, the pads and the markers and places where people can hang information about, you know, how to have safe drinking water or how do you know you tell if your food is still safe to eat afterwards or where would you go? Where, where can you meet up if you lost someone? And so this is what the idea of what an emergency communication, you know, um, hub is in the community, uh, it's very easy for the library to step into this role. So again, a home base, a lot, well, I can't think of a better home base than the library where everybody knows um, where to come after a disaster. And that's the way I like to think of the communications hub as this gathering site. Um, and the, the interesting part about the hub is it's entirely driven by the library and its own unique um, community. Um, and you can see, like I have this little diagram down there um, that it's like, I, I based it on this hub and spoke model. And I, I have to be honest, I stole this from another um, a hub and spoke idea from another library, New Jersey State Library program called NJSL uh, Partners, plus partners that has to do with digital literacy. Uh, but in my other presentation, strictly on the communications hub, I put the library at the center of the hub. I have spokes out to, um, you know, agencies like FEMA and the local certs and local emergency responders. And then there's even further uh, spokes out that if you're, say, a county library system with multiple branches, you're going to have your main headquarters branch as the main hub, but you can put information out to your branches as sort of like spokes around the main, um, around the main center hub of the, 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 the headquarters library. Uh, and so that's sure. what I, so that it's expandable, you know, you could just have one center hub, just one hub if you want, but if you're in a situation where you have branches, you know, you can certainly, um, you know, have, have the spokes out from the central, from the central and main hub. And that, that's really the way that I uh, envisioned it. Michelle? Yes. Uh, we need to wrap. Okay. So I'm almost, I'm almost there. Uh, I want to make sure that the hub is not part of the municipal government. It's not part of the emergency operation system, not a shelter, a medical station, or a fire station, or somewhere to find food and supplies. Um, it's a gathering place where we're connecting people with the information, sharing information that they need. And I always say that we're really not first responders in the traditional sense of the word. We are second responders, but I always like to think of librarians as information first responders. We've talked about the billion dollar disasters, Don, you mentioned. However, we need to start, get away from that and start thinking about the smaller catastrophic events like heat really is the biggest threat out there. And we need to move into action rather than all the doom and gloom. It's here, it's here to stay. We need to be focusing on doing something about it now. And again, librarians need to take their people skills out of the library, reach into the community uh, so that we serve as the central meeting place that brings the community together. So there you go. That's the short of it. That's <laughs> great. Overboard over. So that was really the long of it. But uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The the uh, uh, in the registration on the registration page are links to both the story that Diane just talked about uh, gives a lot of detail there and the tools that are related to that and then of course uh, Michelle's uh, uh, link also uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the the toolkit um, we're right on the hour but. This is not TV, so we tend to run over a little bit, but you'll be excused if you have another commitment. Uh, we're going to keep the recording going. We'll post the recordings for, you know, there's a lot of material we've covered today, just a vast amount with implications. And really, that star metaphor was just perfect for how much more there is to talk about in this particular subject area. 
uh, but uh, the um, uh, the point about FEMA, FEMA has designated libraries as, as essential, and that means that they will fund moving the library if it needs to be moved. Uh, there's a crossover point there about uh, community resilience and library resilience. Well, there's an overlap in that, not in the first phase where it's just kind of the immediate reaction, but during the recovery period, library services become part of the response. You know, what do you do with all the kids that are just kind of hanging loose? How do you how do you do story time in the parking? You know, these kinds of things, uh, which is a uh, 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 fascinating uh, concept. The Diane, could you talk a little bit about uh, ITDRC and what they have done to help you and who they are? It's a, yes. it's a great group. Yes, uh, internet not international, Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. Uh, so when COVID started and so many things shut down, there are a lot of areas um, outside of city limits that do not have connectivity. So Don connected me with ITDRC. They brought over a trailer with a hot spot, parked it in a like a parking lot out by the lake, and left it there for months. So, um, and they did all the work. I just called and said, here's the problem. And they did everything else at no charge to the library. Um, so they set up this hotspot and we would have, um, there would be people gathered around that little trailer doing homework, taking their test, all sorts of things, um, working on their GED. And then I contacted them again and they came out and set up a permanent hotspot in an area without connectivity at a tackle shop. And so people can go to the, the convenience store tackle shop and sit in their parking lot and, and use um, their hotspot. They've been wonderful. Typically, I think they've gone into like after wildfires and floods and, you know, big events, thousands of homes without connectivity, um, but they came to Pottsboro, Texas too. They're, they're amazing. Uh, they should be on everybody's, whatever passes for a Rolodex these days. Uh, and as Diane said, they, they'll do it for free. Uh, they're, this is a group of volunteers uh, based in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, they've got 2,000 people volunteering to parachute in and do rapid response and they can handle just almost any situation and any kind of technology it's an amazing group uh michelle yes yeah i just wanted to mention two things don uh you talked about fema relocating and having funding for libraries that's called the stafford act you can look that up it's when they recognize that libraries are essential services and there there is funding you know to get you reopened again and um, as far as li uh, libraries having, um, being able to get their elect electrical grid up and running again, uh, not in New Jersey with all the small libraries, I find that when a library, library building is actually like in the municipal complex, they're gonna have those big time generators. And so they're all set, but New Jersey is mostly small libraries and the cost of a so, sort of a whole building generator starts at 150,000 on up. And often that will only, you know, get keep your network running. So that's like a, a financial, just a never gonna happen for most of our libraries, but um, you can buy a, a generator, a portable generator for five, under a thousand dollars from Home Depot and at least have that gas powered outside of your library, outside of your library that'll help people charge up their devices, you know, and I'll bet you if you made a plea, Home Depot would probably donate it for you. And one other thing I wanna mention, um, if you really wanna get into this uh, and have the location for FEMA to set up, you know, you have to get this done ahead of time. And there's a thing that an electrician can install, it's called a pigtail, don't ask me what it is. It probably costs a couple thousand dollars, but then you let FEMA know that you have this pigtail and they are able to just drive right on in, plug in, and then operate right as a, right outside your library. But they can't do that unless you're you're already prepared to have that happen. So you might want to look into that if you would like to really be the center of the you know helping people afterwards, right alongside working right alongside the feeding. Good tip. Good tip. Uh, this point about the 
ability of first responders to actually respond in these large scale uh, events. Uh, you mentioned an example of uh, untrained volunteers. Uh, that's just kind of one piece of that, that puzzle. Uh, the facilities that the first responders are in are also inadequate to be a, a gathering place or really a control for this. Uh, they're, they're just running amok in, in these kinds of situations. Uh, there's an example, I, I've been looking for more of these and if anybody knows about it, please share. Uh, Lafayette, Louisiana uh, saw a huge influx of refugees from Katrina. And so they said, well, we weren't ready for this. So what can we do? They opened a new branch specifically as the disaster coordination hub for Lafayette. So it's it's amazingly well wired. I mean, it operates as an ordinary branch every day, but it has all this capacity ready to go, like what you just described as pigtail and, and lots of other things. I thought that was really fascinating that they would invest in uh, that kind of capability and understanding that it was a natural role. So this is a question about you know, uh, libraries say, I mean, we, we were doing a project for IMLS several years ago about this as second responders, second uh, responder communication networks. And uh, uh, a question we got from IMLS was, well, why would libraries want to take this on? You know, they're already overloaded with all these other roles. And I think one of you or both of you just made the point, it doesn't matter whether you volunteer to do this or not, people are going to show up. They're just going to show up because you know they think of the library as a place you get information and communication. So you might as well <laughs> accept that. Uh, and if you can prepare, so much the better. Um, I had a question for both of you about uh, EMA and these offices, local, state, FEMA, federal, uh, in terms of uh, coordination or recognition, or there was a question about... Um, you know, uh, uh, or, or are they certified? All that. It's it's just a it's just a knowledge level. Uh, is there is there an awareness? Is there a process to contact uh, state and local EMA offices and you know say, well, this is what we're doing. This is what we want to do. What do you suggest? And do we have a protocol for when the proverbial hits the fan? you know how do we interact with each other is that is that something to do as well formally either one both of you i could i could take a shot at that um so you're muted oh, there you go question um am i oh am i unmuted no you're fine yeah, you're, unmuted. you're unmuted now you're muted Michelle, you're muted. Michelle? Am I good? You're good. Yeah. All right. Sorry, folks. So in New Jersey, we're lucky that we have a really good partnership with our Office of Emergency Management. Uh, and I attend their stakeholder meetings and find out what's going on. Um, and uh, we're also written um, into their, uh, uh, their, fr their emergency framework. Or it's got, it, it, ESF 14, we're under ESF 14, and that that the libraries are included under there as well as cultural institutions. But that was a relationship um, that I reached out for, um, that I reached out to them and did talks for them about all the things that the libraries had to offer, you know. Uh, and so in doing that repeatedly and keeping the contact up, they now con they now include us at the state library in um, in what they're doing and in various meetings and everything. However, I, I don't have any kind of a protocol from with them about okay how how am I how can I help a local community then um, you know organize this. So that that part B of your question um, I don't have. But as a state entity, a state uh, institution, we've reached out to other state you know uh, organizations. Uh, that that will help us maintain that partnership with OEM, and so that they're constantly aware of the role that libraries play, and they are aware now. Good, Diane. I think you made a point about that. 
Yeah, in our case, okay. that we, we included the uh, County Office of Emergency Management in that community debrief where there was so much discussion about citizens really helping other citizens. So when they did that cert training at the library, then all those citizens became certified under this program. So they're in the, the phone tree um, in OEM. So if a disaster happens in our county that they need these responders, these CERT trained uh, members, then OEM contacts them. Good, good. You said if uh, disaster <laughs> happens. Uh, I think we're going to move into the when disaster happens as actually a, a normal occurrence or not a, a, a rare occurrence. Um, there's a there, there's kind of phases of this, which you've touched on. So uh, the situational awareness uh, is this brilliant uh, concept. Uh, we would call that reaction. You know, that's the first thing. This, this was our awareness when COVID hit. The first thing is reaction. What the hell's going on? What do we do? Uh, and then there's then there's response. You know, some kind of organized effort to deal with whatever is happening. And then there's recovery. You know, how do we how do we extend this and 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 get back? And so those are all different activities. But this first phase, uh, it, it's we liken it to a stroke response, where they say time is brain. And in a disaster scale, time is like lives and urgency of having uh, a resource and an action ready to go is just incredibly important. Uh, I, I suspect that a lot of these volunteers would not come in for cert training, Diane. I think, you know, they just, they respond to their, it's their situational awareness. Uh, and they don't think about playing the role until it happens. And they go, well, I need to do something or I need somebody to help me, <laughs> you know, both, both ways. So the recurring uh, notion here, it, it relates to communication because how do I know what's going on? How do I know what's what? Where do I get that? The radio station? That's not going to provide, you know, much very specific information. So this is this just seems like a vector for libraries as, <laughs> as communicators. Are there, are there strategies? Well, I also wanted to touch on um, there in terms of the this library building being a, a disaster response um, hub is I'm talking to you from our telehealth room. And so in, in this room here in this library, um, you know, depending on the disaster, it might be a very important resource that we have a room for people to connect with healthcare providers. Very good. And, you know, the people, people do have all, every, there's so many uh, happenings in in a chaotic event that you know you just can't prepare for everything you have to do what librarians do is use their judgment and solve a problem that's in front of them it's just extraordinary um there's a there's a kind of an investment curve related to to crises and response and that's before it happens and the tendency is well you know Yes, we need to do that, but we can't do it today because we've got three other things that are just really happening right now. We'll get to it. We'll get to it, but not today. Uh, and that, of course, just keeps going every day. And then it happens. And then the situation completely changes and the check blank check comes out. Whatever it costs, we need help today, right now. And then later on, after it's over, then there's a, it kind of tapers off. What? How big of a lesson did we learn? We're going to be ready for next time and so on and so on. So it's just hard to overcome that. Our notion is to integrate as much of the disaster response services into everyday services. So your example with telehealth is excellent because that's what you can do every day, but yet it, it blends over into a disaster response service. So that's, that's great. Communication, ordinarily, you know, people go to the library to communicate, connect to the internet and so forth. Uh, and if you have a way to run that without electricity in a disaster, then then you've you've got a, a dual uh, win. So um, can I add and, one more thing, Don? Yes, please go ahead. We're going to uh, wrap up. Go ahead. Comments. Yeah, 
you know, you have to, as far as workers taking on a lot and unions not wanting their workers to step into this role, um, you have to allow for the fact that your, your staffs may be suffering the emergency too with their own families and their own homes. And you have to allow them and give them permission to stay home and take care of themselves first. Um, there are some people that are very good in an emergency and there's some people that just can't handle that. And you have to respect that too. Um, so uh, know your staff, you know, put together a crisis team that you know people who would be able to step up and be able to handle these different types of emergencies. Um, but you know, we're there for the community. And I, I, I truly believe, I firmly believe that this is part of our mission to serve. It's not, um, it's not an option, but allow your staff, give your staff permission to take care of themselves first. That's a great comment. Um, we're we're going to use that as your closing comment, Michelle, so people remember that. And Diane, we're going to go to you for a closing comment, and then we're going to wrap this up. Just, uh, strategically, um, I, I think even though funding is hard to come by for preparing in advance, it is one tool that our library is using to elevate our image throughout the county it, again that we're involved with essential services and big thinking that we're not the the traditional stereotypical library that a lot of the county commissioners or county judge who haven't come into the library building this is a way for us to let them know that um, we need to be at the table too that's great. It's uh, the, the the notion that you know the the presumption that libraries are nice to have is short of the actuality that they are in fact essential services and that they do more things than any other public institution by a far. When we say the Swiss Army knife of public institutions, they uh, and, and it just keeps growing. Uh, you know, kind of un fortunately, unfortunately, but. That's the way it's built to be responsive to whatever the community wants. So I want to thank you both and so much for taking the time and delivering really important messages that we have recorded and will be available for playback soon. So I'm going to ask the people who have hung around the hardcore here, everybody, if you would unmute here, please, everyone unmute, because if if we were together we don't have an unmute everybody, but uh, if we were together in a room at a conference somewhere and you deliver these presentations, we'd be giving you a round of applause right now. So that's what we want to do uh, is thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that, we'll conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll focus on uh, education and health using low Earth orbit satellites next week. So be on the lookout. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.